What's up you guys, it's Peter and today I want to cover another one of these useful tools for your visual effects toolbox. It is going to be the cross product. So let's have a look on Wikipedia first at the definition, maybe also some more resources on Khan Academy. And then I'm going to show you how to use it in Houdini as well as perhaps some examples. So let's go take a closer look. So here on the Wikipedia page for the cross product, we can already kind of scroll down a little bit and go have a closer look at the definition. The cross product is defined by this formula. So what is it? So we first have two vectors, a vector A crossed by a vector B is equal to the length of the vector A times the length of the vector B times the sine of theta, which is the angle in between the two vectors. And then here multiplied by N and N is the perpendicular vector to the plane defined by both A and B. So we'll go a little bit deeper into that in just a moment. Now, something to note before we covered the dot product and the dot product had two vectors as inputs and a single float as output. The cross product, on the other hand, has two vectors as an input and a single vector as an output. So there's a bit of a difference between the dot and the cross product. Also, they are computed in a different way. Now let's go have a quick look. Um, if you want to find more in-depth information, you can also over here go to Khan Academy and basically uh, find the algebraic definition and there is more information as well on how it is being used in different scenarios. Now for our case in Houdini, we basically want to understand um, how to get to this, this N, this, this you know, perpendicular vector to the plane defined by A and B. And there is something called the right hand rule. And I'm going to showcase a little bit in Houdini how we can kind of compute that as well. Um, later on, we are going to go a little bit further and we're going to be able to sort of, you know, all the way here, um, deal with the geometric par parallelogram defined by A and B and how that relates to our cross product vector. So that's also going to be nice to kind of showcase how that works. Okay, let's dive now into Houdini. And I've made a couple of examples over here. So here, geo cross product example, uh, sort of explanation and a later example. So let's have a look. I'm going to shrink this down again. There we go. And so I have a normal and I also have an up vector. And here the cross product is going to be the resulting um, computation from these two vectors. So let's dive inside and have a quick look how I did this. So first of all, uh, we're going to create a single point. So I have a single point that is sitting at the origin and I can create two vectors for them. So with an attribute create, I create a normal that is pointing over here in the Z direction. So if we visualize the normal over here, it is pointing in the Z direction. It is of unit length. Um, and then also over here, attribute create the up vector and we can display the up vector here. I'm just going to turn it on for just a moment. So we can see we have the normal here and we have the up vector in the Y up axis. So the normal is currently in Z and the up vector is in the Y up value. So next I want to compute the cross product. So if we look at the cross vector, right? So again, we can already see I have a new attribute called cross. Here's my normal, here's my up and we can visualize that in the viewport as well. So here, there is my third vector that is sticking out the red one. So let's have a quick look inside of Houdini how that works. So inside of the attribute VOP, I can simply specify over here, take the up vector, currently it's normalized, take the normal, which is also normalized, and cross the two vectors together to get a resulting cross product vector. We're also going to normalize the result and I'm going to output this into a cross attribute. So let's have a closer look. I can copy two points over here, the resulting vector geometry that I've made. So I've, this is just for visualization in the viewport. You don't necessarily have to do this, but this will be making it a little bit easier to understand how it works. So just quickly, I started over here with a single sort of arrow. I rotated it so that it is aligned with the Z axis. This will be our normal. And I've done the same thing for the up vector over here. So basically uh, added an up annotation to it. And then finally over here for the cross vector, uh, we have the last one. So notice that the way that they're placed currently, they're all perpendicular to one another. So in order to visualize the perpendicular nature of it, I've made a few uh, little line segments. So if we look at this uh, together over here, 
then we can kind of see I have two little lines which we can fuse together, do a little polywire on them, rotate them a couple of times, right, and merge them all together to indicate that indeed these vectors are perpendicular to one another. Okay, so this will help us to visualize that part of it in terms of the vectors. Now let's talk briefly about this third vector. Uh, you know, we have the, the normal and the up vector and the cross. So here I have a, made a reference of the hand. So what does that mean, right? So here, this, now let's talk a little bit about the right hand rule. So notice that this is indeed a uh, a hand and it's the right hand it's not the left hand so that means we have the thumb we have the index finger and we have the middle fig finger and so the thumb is going to represent our first vector so that is our up vector the normal is going to be represented by our index finger and then the resulting uh, sort of perpendicular vector that comes out of it is going to be represented by our middle finger now it doesn't really matter which uh, you know re vector represents what as long as you kind of sort of follow the order so that means you start with the thumb then you go with the normal and then finally the resulting one will be the middle finger if we were to start with the index finger and then we go to the middle finger then the resulting vector will be the thumb if we start with the middle finger and then we go to the thumb then the resulting vector will be the note over here the index so those directions that we have with our you know, right hand rule basically it starts with the first finger then the next finger the resulting middle finger comes next and so on if you start with the index and then go to the middle finger then the thumb will be the result if you start with the middle finger and then go to the thumb then the index finger will be the result. So it is important in the way that you count, uh, you know, the normals or the, the order of operations is important. If you were to say, go with the normal first and then use the thumb, right? Then it is going to flip the resulting cross factor. Now I'll uh, maybe showcase that example in just a moment. So if we go back to our normals over here, right, they're currently all displayed in the viewport. So we can say if we start with our normal or rather we start with our up vector, then we do our normal and then the resulting vector will be over here, the cross vector. Let's briefly change the order of operations. So what I mean by that is what happens if I were to swap these two around? So we can simply select the cross product and do shift R and that moves them around. Notice that now the third vector, the cross vector, is pointing in the opposite direction. So it is important, the order of operations is important. Is it going to be the up vector first or is it going to be the normal first? So, okay, let's switch, switch them back, right? And then I'm going to go to my second example. So over here, I have an example whereby I have specified, let's uh, visualize everything here for a moment. Right. So again, we have our circles where this is a unit circle, so we can see the um, the length of the individual vector. So we can see currently uh, the length of my normal. They're all normalized. Uh, again, the blue vector represents the normal. The green vector represents the up vector. But I've also made over here uh, this sort of um, Currently, it looks like a square, but it's actually a parallelogram. Um, and we will compute the area of the parallelogram, and also we will compute the length over here of the cross vector. And so as I start to move in time now, right, I can basically update my vectors. And you can kind of sort of see that as we update the vectors, this, the shape of this square is now a parallelogram, is updating. And also we can kind of see that this resulting vector is going to start changing in length. So as we kind of keep uh, you know, stepping through it, we can see the different you know, length vectors and we can also see how this vector evolves over time. So it kind of comes out in one axis and then points in the other direction. Right, so basically, what is going on over here? Well, ba basically, if you think about it, what the area calculation is of, um, you know, of this uh, parallelogram, it is the length of A times the length of B, and uh, it takes the cosine, uh, sorry, the sine of theta into account, um, as well as sort of the uh, um, the normal over here. So what I want to do next is I want to sort of um, 
go in and sort of display a little bit how this is getting all computed. So over here, I have my normals, I have my target normal, and I have my other normal. And so these normals are basically getting updated over time, right? So we can kind of sort of see it is starting to rotate. So it's the same thing uh, with the computation of tracing the circle. So we start with a point, we're going to trace the circle, which is sine and cosine times dollar ff. And then we can scale them up a little bit if we needed to, just in case if we are dealing with not normalized vectors. So between the point at the origin and the point that is going to rotate along the circle, we can create the new line segment. We can just color it a little bit and we can normalize it if necessary. So these things we've done for the dot product as well. So here we have, um, you know, aren't rotating first normal. And then here we have our other normal as well. All right, so this one is not, this one is kind of static. And so as we kind of rotate, we can see the different vectors update. So next I can kind of compute the cross product. So here, if we look at what the cross vector is doing, we can see it's already visualizing on all of the points in the viewport. So I have my computations. So what do I want to do here? Well, basically I want to go and grab the target point. So here we basically we're starting for each of these points, we're starting and we're going to grab the point number of the second input, well, actually of the first input, and let's say point number one. So point number one is this point here. We're also going to grab point number three, which is this point here. So really we're starting at the origin and we're going to compute the vector towards point number one and the vector towards point number three. Now, in our case, we can simply grab the position of point number one, as well as the position of point number three, and normalize these positions, which is really going to give me the vector that is pointing from the origin to either point number one, or the vector that is going from the origin to point number three. So these are going to be the normalized vectors in those specific directions. We can cross them together, and we're going to get the output cross product. We can then over here do the length computation of that resulting cross vector. So basically this red vector, how long is it? And I'm going to multiply it by a thousand, you know, convert float to int, and then basically uh, set it back into float and then multiply it back by 0 0.01. What am I doing here? I'm basically rounding that number so that we don't end up with like too much, uh, you know, small you know, values after the period. So then this is going to be outputting that value as a string cross result rounded string. So with the inline, we can do basically uh, keep only the portion that we want and limit the, um, you know, the amount of uh, detail in that string. Okay, so that's my cross product here. And then here we can kind of merge it together with um, the resulting line segment. So again, I'm going to grab a point, I'm going to grab the resulting cross geometry. I am after that cross product now. So I'm going to apply the cross product value that we have computed here as that cross attribute, right? So here the cross vector is available to us. So I can basically go and look that up and we're going to move that point simply by saying, go from the second input, go grab point number zero and grab the cross attribute and apply that to the position. So that allows me to update that point. Now we can merge them together and there is the resulting point that is going to form my cross vector or my cross line segment in just a moment. All right, so here we're going to create that line segment. So polygons, right, create a new segment and we can color it red so we can see it a little bit. We can also over here add a measure sub so that we can measure the perimeter, basically the length of this, um, this little line segment. So if we look at our spreadsheet now on the primitive attributes, we can see there is our length of our cross product vector, right? And so the whole point is to showcase that the length of this little line segment is going to be equal to the area size of the parallelogram defined by those two incoming vectors. Okay, so let's now build the parallelogram. So this is, you know, these are our different vectors, right? And I've put a poly wire on them so we can see them a little bit better in the viewport. Okay, so let's keep going. And here I want to create that parallelogram. So how do we do that? Well, we're simply going to bring in both of those line segments. So this is my first vector. And then here, this will be my second um, vector. 
um, and I'm going to create yet another little line segment. So what I can do is literally move this first line segment and right, displace it in the direction of our second vector so that we can create ourselves, we can create two line segments here that will eventually form my polygon. So how do we do that? Well, we grab our first line segment, we grab our second line segment over here, especially over here, this, this one, that's going to be our displacement uh, direction vector. And I can simply go and say, okay, go grab from that second input point number one. So this is what I was saying, point number one over here, this point. We're going to go grab its position and I'm simply going to add its position to all of my points. And then it's going to offset them, basically displace my points so that I can kind of get my second line segment here. And we can skin them together. Skinning is a very useful operation. It basically allows us to get to two lines and create a polygon, two or more lines, you can do it with many more lines, and create a polygon out of that. So if we now look at this, right, you can see that we indeed have a primitive. So next, with this primitive, I've made it semi-transparent so we can kind of see through it if we need to, we can measure the area size. And so this is what I'm after, right? So this area size, again, with the measure sum, we can calculate the perimeter, we can calculate the area, a whole bunch of other things too. And so here, let's have a quick look at the spreadsheet. And so now we can see the area size. So as the, you know, parallelogram updates, the area size updates with it. Great. So let's do the same thing in terms of rounding the area. So literally just uh, bringing the area in, multiplying it by a thousand, and then over here outputting it as an area string so that we can put it inside of our font SOPs in just a moment. So let's see what's next. So the next thing that I want to sort of show is we have these brief sort of, uh, you know, indicators of, uh, you know, the perpendicular nature of it. So we can kind of just showcase how we brought that in and how we made that. So here I'm bringing in the main normal, we can carve to something like 0 0.2 so that we only are dealing with, you know, a short line segment. We can also take the other vector. So this is a cross product vector, carve out 0 0.2 as well, and then copy one line or one uh, line onto the other point. So here we can kind of sort of see that we're only taking point number zero as our source point and the target point will be point number one. So we'll do that for the other side as well. So we create these sort of L-shaped uh, little segments right here, and uh, we can fuse them together, right? And then mix them with the other L-shaped segment as well. So same deal, we basically bring in the other vector. So this will be our up vector. Uh, we can carve a small segment out of this. We bring in our uh, cross product vector, and then we carve a small segment out of that. We can copy again onto this, the point that we're interested in the same thing for the other side. And so if we merge them together, right, we basically have our two segments, L-shaped segments, merge this together with the other vectors segment, and we can color this and turn this into a little, uh, you know, perpendicular visualizer. So when we merge that together with everything else, we will basically see, okay, great, everything is nicely um, updating, and it's basically flipping as we kind of go. Next, I want to sort of uh, do the annotations for the cross length area and this. So we need to go and grab those attributes and add them inside of a font sub. So in the font sub, we can basically say, okay, go grab over here with a point string attribute. We're going to grab that rounded string, which we have computed as part of our cross product calculation. Great, let's add that in there. So that basically is this cross length. And then also we're going to grab the parallelogram area. The whole point is to make sure that they are indeed of the same value. So here, same deal with the parallelogram. Go grab primitive string because it's basically the area we computed on the primitive. And um, over here, it's called area string. That was the attribute that we created with the perimeter sub where we measured it. Okay, merge these two together. We can move them a little bit. And uh, basically, lastly, we are we still need to sort of do the annotations for the cross product here and the circle you know, one, zero, negative one. So let's briefly have a quick look at that. Here is my circle. I'm going to do a poly wire, change the color a little bit, and then here are all the annotations. So, you know, just one, zero, and negative one, and cross product. Okay, great. So with that, we have a nice example now of the cross product as it updates over time. And so hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of the relationship between all of these different vectors. Um, now let's dive into some examples, right?